Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to cover uh, some information about how student privacy uh, can be protected when you are using education technology, and particularly when you're using online educational apps and services. So just to give an idea of what we're going to cover today, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA which some of you have probably heard of in the past. I'm um, going to talk about some consequences if you uh, inadvertently violate FERPA uh, and how we do our enforcement activities at the Department of Education. I'll cover some frequently asked questions about how FERPA uh, applies in the ed tech space. I'll then continue that with um, kind of walking through um, some good and not so good provisions in a typical terms of service agreement for an EdTech product. Uh, and then lastly, I'll kind of end with some resources that we have available and our uh, technical assistance materials, uh, and then I'll open the floor to questions. So what is the US Department of Education's role in protecting student privacy? Well, first and foremost, we're responsible for administering and enforcing uh, the various federal laws that govern uh, student privacy in the education space. And that, those include, most notably, uh, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, and the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, or PPRA. But administering these laws is only a part of what we do. Uh, we also see it as a core function of our mission uh, to raise awareness about the privacy challenges and risks that we see arising uh, in the education sector today. Uh, we provide extensive technical assistance to the education community, uh, including schools, districts, states, and increasingly to the education technology uh, community themselves on how to improve privacy protections and data security protections, uh, and most notably, best practice recommendations for going above and beyond mere compliance with the law. Uh, and lastly, as I mentioned, we like to promote uh, this, this concept that compliance should be your, the starting point, not the finish line, that we should all do a better job of protecting student privacy whenever we can. So why is education technology such a challenge when you're thinking about privacy? Well, there's, there's a few factors at work here. Uh, the first is that schools are increasingly contracting out and outsourcing functions that they used to provide themselves. Um, in days gone by, uh, teachers would be doing all of the instructional uh, delivery within the classroom, but now increasingly um, with personalized learning, with online apps and services, um, teachers are relying on these third-party tools to provide a large portion of the content uh, that students consume in the classroom. Another reason why this is such a challenge is we live in a data society. We have a lot more types of data and a whole lot more of it that we are collecting and using uh, to do all of our various functions. Um, another big challenge is the increasing move away from kind of two-party negotiated contracts to a, a take it or leave it click wrap uh, model uh, where uh, a user is presented with a, a user agreement or a terms of service and they either accept it or reject it uh, and that that is the binding contract between parties. Uh, there is, in the community, an increasing concern about the commercialization of student information and the use of student information for marketing purposes. Um, that has driven a lot of the action that we're going to hear about later today uh, with the um, legislation in uh, state legislatures around the country. And finally, and a big challenge here, is there's a communications barrier that exists. Uh, we rely extensively on education technology uh, in the classroom and to, to further uh, students' uh, educational process and outcomes. Uh, but we generally do a very poor job of explaining to parents and students what information is being collected, uh, how it's being used, how it's being protected, and what value the student is getting back from those uses. And so that communications barrier um, tends to lead to a lot of misinformation and can instill fear in the part of parents about, well, what data is really being collected about my child and how are you protecting it? Uh, in, at the bottom here, uh, I think a very important uh, statement, we need to use data effectively and efficiently uh, and appropriately while we still protect students' privacy. It's not an either or, we can and have to do both. So, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, uh, it's 
in the statute at 20 U.S.C. section 1232G. Uh, it was originally passed by Congress back in 1974. Uh, since then, it has only received minor, statu uh, minor statutory amendments. Um, and its most recent change was in 2013 uh, with the inclusion of the Uninterrupted Scholars Act. Um, the regulations are at 34 CFR Part 99. Uh, most recent re-regulations that we've done on FERPA were in 2008 uh, and in 2011. Uh, just to give a little bit of context, uh, because FERPA's age uh, poses some interesting challenges when we look at uh, how to comply with these legal requirements uh, in the context of this digital world that we live in. So to give you a little bit of context, back in 1974, uh, education records were for the most part pieces of paper in a file folder in the principal's office. That is not what we have as education records today. Um, similarly, education technology barely existed. Um, to give you an idea, you can see the little computer here, the IBM 5100 portable computer. Uh, was introduced a year after FERPA was passed, in 1975, had a whopping 64K of memory, and cost $20,000. So we have, we have evolved somewhat since those mid-70s days on, on how we use technology, the ubiquitousness of technology, uh, and how technology has transformed what we think of as education records. But as you can see, the fact that the statute has not been amended much and the fact that we have not regulated that much, uh, it means that interpreting those requirements in the context of these new and rapidly evolving technologies can sometimes be a real challenge. So we're gonna talk about some of those implications uh, in the tech space today. So for starters, FERPA's applicability. To whom does FERPA apply? Well, FERPA applies to any educational agency or institution uh, at the elementary, secondary, or post-secondary level that receives any funding, either directly or indirectly, from the U.S. Department of Education. So in the K-12 space, that will primarily be your public schools, your public schools and school districts. Uh, in the post-secondary space, it's virtually all post-secondary institutions, as virtually all colleges and universities receive Title IV uh, assistance um, from the department. So K-12 space, mostly public schools, post-secondary, everybody. What does FERPA do? Well, FERPA grants certain rights to parents and eligible students, uh, including the right to access and to seek to amend the student's education records, and it protects any personally identifiable information from the student's education records from redisclosure without the prior written consent of that parent or eligible student unless an exception applies. Now there's a few terms here that we need to understand in order to understand the applicability of the statute's requirements here. The first, eligible students. So FERPA grants rights to parents. Um, but when a student becomes an eligible student, either by turning 18 or by enrolling in a post-secondary institution at any age, then those rights transfer from the parent to that eligible student. So parents and eligible students, you'll hear me use that term that phrase a lot over the course of the next hour. Uh, secondly, uh, we've got two terms here, um, personally identifiable information and education records. And these are both terms of art under the statute and regulations that require a little definition. So what is an education record under FERPA? Well, it's anything that is directly related to the student and that is maintained by an educational agency or institution or by a party acting for an educational agency or institution. So if you are an ed tech company and you are acting on the school's behalf, creating and maintaining records for the school that directly relate to a student, there's a very good chance that you are creating and maintaining education records because you're doing it on the school's behalf. The other term that needs some definition is personally identifiable information. So I often joke, um, if you get 10 privacy professionals into a room and ask them to define PII, you're gonna get at least 15 or 20 definitions. Um, and it's not just because people think about it differently, but it's because almost every privacy law out there defines PII in slightly different ways. And we noticed this a moment ago uh, when Kristen from the Federal Trade Commission was talking about how they define PII under COPPA. Well, FERPA is no exception. It also has its own definition of what is considered personally identifiable information. Uh, and you can think of it as roughly having three categories of information in it. 
The first would be any of your direct identifiers. These are things that have a one-to-one -one relationship to a student, that data elements that can uniquely pick out a specific individual. So things like a uh, social security number or student ID number would be excellent examples of direct identifiers where you can have absolutely no ambiguity that this record is of this particular student. It also includes your indirect identifiers. These are data elements that have um, a many-to-one relationship. They may not uniquely identify the individual, uh, but they can certainly help you narrow it down. And a good example there would be birthday. With only 365 days in a year, odds are many students will share the same birthday. Doesn't uniquely identify that student, but it certainly helps you narrow down who that student might be. Um, so indirect identifiers are considered PII as well. But then FERPA goes one step further and it includes as this kind of third bin of information, any other information that either alone or in combination is linked or linkable to a student and that would allow a reasonable person in the school's community to re-identify that student with any reasonable certainty. So there's a lot of reasonables in there and, and it can seem a little confusing. Essentially what you can think of here is, this is the catch-all category. Because just about any piece of information in the right context can become identifiable, can allow you to hone in on a specific individual. So let me give you an example. If you know that, if you say that a student is in Mrs. Berngard's third grade class, well, there's 30 students in Mrs. Berngard's third grade class. Could be any one of them. But if you then add on another piece of information and say, well, this student was also in Mr. Davis's fourth grade class, well, there you probably nailed, um, narrowed it down to maybe 10 students. And if you were then able to say, well, and they were in Mrs. Smith's fifth grade class, well, there you probably, only narrowed, you probably narrowed it down to one or two. Each additional piece of information helps you hone in on a specific individual. And when we're talking about technology, these apps and services that collect vast amounts of information in the form of metadata, in the form of contextual information, it can suddenly become very, very easy to piece those little breadcrumbs together and link it back to a specific individual. And in fact, we see this uh, in, in the tech space, uh, in other industries all the time. So long story short, what does this last category mean? Uh, it means that there is no defined list of data elements that are or are not PII under FERPA. Just about any data element could be PII in the right context. So you really have to look holistically at what is the, the, the total content of information that you're collecting and protect it accordingly. So as I mentioned a moment ago, FERPA requires written parental consent before you can disclose PII from an education record unless an, unless an exception applies. Well, what does that consent mean? What do you need for that consent to be valid? Well, you need a few things under the law. The first is you need to specify the record or records that are going to be disclosed. So what PII are you going to be disclosing about the student? Secondly, you have to specify to whom you are going to disclose that information, the party or categories of party that will be receiving it. And thirdly, you have to specify the purpose for which the disclosure is being made. So what data, to whom, and why? If you meet those three things, it can be a valid consent. And we have, we have said that these written consent statements may be done electronically, provided you've properly authenticated the identity of the individual that's providing the consent. But, as I mentioned, um, requires written consent unless an exception applies. And there are a number of exceptions uh, to this written consent requirement that apply in different situations. Uh, in fact, there are quite a few of them under the law, and, and some of them are very specific and very limited uh, in terms of how they apply. Um, there are two here that are most relevant for our discussion today about FERPA in education technology. Uh, the first is the directory information exception, and the second is the school official exception. So we're going to be focusing on those today. But if you're interested in some of these others, um, I'll provide a link at the end to our website, and you can, you can read through um, some resources about when, when these other exceptions apply as well. So the directory information exception. Well, students do not attend school anonymously. Uh, in fact, it is routine and common practice and acceptable practice uh, 
for schools to disclose certain relatively non-sensitive information about students as part of their kind of daily activities in the school. These could be things like um, the school telephone directory or email directory. It could be uh, concert programs for the, for the school choir. It could be uh, information about student athletes that are playing on the JV or varsity teams. Uh, it could be your school's yearbook. Uh, all of these are situations where you are providing certain information about students for these routine activities um, because you kind of need to in order for students to be able to kind of participate in these various school activities. So to that end, FERPA includes an exception to that written consent requirement for the disclosure of certain directory information. It's important to note, however, that this is a very limited exception about when it can apply. For starters, directory information can include a few different types of relatively non-sensitive information about students. Name, contact information, um, what years they attended school, any honors or awards they received, etc. There's a, a variety of things that could be designated, but it can never include your more sensitive data elements like social security number or race and ethnicity or special education status or um, like your test scores. None of those more sensitive pieces can be designated as directory information. Only these kind of low sensitivity ones can be included. The, the second big limitation with directory information here is that you can't provide directory information that's either implicitly or explicitly linked to other information that is not directory information. So for example, if a school has a directory information policy that includes uh, parents' names and telephone numbers for the school phone book, for example, they could release that list for all of the students in the school under this exception, with a caveat that I'm gonna mention in a minute. Um, if, on the other hand, somebody came to the school and said, I want parents' names and phone numbers for any of your students with a disability. Well, it would still be the same information, parents' names and phone numbers, but because it's implicitly linked to this filter, only for students who have disabilities, you could not release it because you are then implicitly further disclosing that each of those students in turn have a disability. So you cannot link non-directory information to directory information and then release it. Uh, that would be prohibited under this exception. The other important caveat, if I can, there we go, uh, is that in order to make use of this exception, the schools have to do certain things. The first is they must provide an annual notification to parents about their directory information policy. And in that policy, they have to designate the specific data elements that they consider to be directory information. They also then have to provide parents and eligible students the opportunity to opt out of disclosures under this exception. Now, this right to opt out is not exercised frequently, but it is exercised on occasion. Uh, and in those cases, if a parent or eligible student opts out of disclosures under this exception, then they cannot, the school cannot use the directory information exception to disclose that information. So you could not put the student's name in that concert program. You couldn't put their name in the yearbook, et cetera, without written consent. So have to have an annual notice. In that notice, you have to designate your directory information and you have to provide parents the opportunity to opt out. The other thing I want to stress here in considering director information in the education technology context is that because these policies are determined at the school level, you will see substantial variation in what data elements are considered directory information from school to school, from district to district, and from state to state. So don't just assume that a certain piece of information is always going to be considered directory information. It frequently may be excluded from somebody else's policy. All right, the other exception to FERPA's written consent requirement that is particularly relevant in the ed tech context is the school official exception. Now this is another uh, exception to the requirement that you have written parental consent and it's used to allow schools to disclose student information to other employees with the school that are deemed to have a legitimate educational interest in the information uh, and to certain third parties who the school has designated as school officials who are prof providing a function or service for the school. But in order to make use of this exception, in order to disclose to a third party entity 
a contractor, a volunteer, um, someone you're outsourcing a function to, uh, certain requirements have to be met. For starters, that third party has to be providing a function or service that the school would otherwise use their own employees to perform. Secondly, that third party would have to be under the direct control of the school or district with regard to their use and maintenance of the student information that they are receiving. Thirdly, the third party can only use the PII from education records that they receive for the specific purpose or purposes for which it was disclosed to them and no other purpose. And lastly, that third party has to fall within the definition of school official with legitimate educational interest that the school included in its annual notice of FERPA rights to parents and students. So every year the schools have to provide this notice of the parents and eligible students' rights. Included in that is the school's criteria for considering who is and is not a school official with legitimate educational interest. So for this last criteria to be met, um, that third party would have to fall within how the school has defined that concept. So, I want to pause for a second and discuss a recent enforcement action uh, that we had from the U.S. Department of Education that ties in to this idea of consent and the exceptions to consent. Uh, and this is our letter to Agora Cyber Charter Schools that was issued in November of 2017. Uh, this exception focuses on the idea of, well, when can you rely on consent to disclose records to an ed tech company, and when can't you? And central to this enforcement finding is the notion that a parent or an eligible student cannot be forced to waive their rights under FERPA as a condition of enrolling or participating in uh, public education. So in this particular case, parents were being presented with a terms of service agreement that they had to consent to. And some of the terms within that terms of service would have violated FERPA. Because it was required for the parents to sign this before they could enroll their children in the school, we determined that that practice by the school was a violation of FERPA because a parent cannot be required to waive their rights. Uh, so what does this mean for the broader use of consent versus the school official exception under FERPA in the EdTech space? Well, essentially what it means is that if you are using a piece of technology and that technology is gonna be required of all students or required for anyone who's participating, uh, then you would need to go with one of the exceptions to consent route because you can't force a parent or eligible student to consent to something that would violate FERPA. If on the other hand, you are providing an app or service as an optional additional service or optional tool for the student to use, in those cases, because it is not required, because it would not be mandatory, then you could rely on the consent route in order to disclose student PII to the ed tech provider. So if it's mandatory, go with the school official exception. If it's optional or recommended, you can go with the consent route. And we can talk more about that towards uh, the end in the question session. Um, I do want to point out a couple related resources that we've got that tie into these. We've got our Protecting Student Privacy While Using Online Educational Services guidance uh, and our Model Terms of Service. Both of these are um, resources that I'm going to be talking more about in a few minutes. So FERPA is not the only law that applies in this space. We heard about COPPA earlier. Uh, we're going to hear about the, the vast number of state student privacy laws that have passed over the last few years uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, but I do also want to point your attention to the Protection of People Rights Amendment. Uh, this is the other law that my office administers and enforces. Uh, it's the lesser known kind of sibling to FERPA. And this protects any personal information collected directly from students in the K-12 context um, and provides certain rights to parents uh, relating to uh, the administration of surveys and the collection of information in certain protected topics, protected topic areas that are defined under the law, uh, and also includes some additional restrictions on uh, the use of student information for marketing purposes. Uh, we don't have time today to go into all of these in depth, uh, but I can share some resources later that um, I can point you to uh, if you want to learn more about this or I can, I can answer your questions during the Q&A. So enforcement. Uh, so what happens if a school or an education technology vendor uh, violates the law or if a parent or student 
believes that their rights have been violated under the law. Well, parents and eligible students have the right to file a formal complaint with my office, the Student Privacy Policy Office at the US Department of Education. When those complaints come in, we will evaluate the complaint uh, and respond accordingly. Uh, they can file their complaints at studentprivacy.ed.gov. Uh, if we find that a school or an EdTech vendor was in violation of the law, um, there are some potential consequences uh, that in the extreme can go all the way up to uh, withholding all of the federal funding for that educational agency or institution, or the imposition of a five-year ban on receiving further student PII uh, from that school or district. Uh, so the enforcement consequences can be substantial, and this is not even counting any reputational harm that your district or that your company might face for having been found to be in violation. Now, Many out there who say that FERPA is a paper tiger, uh, that we've never uh, in the 45 years that the law has been around actually withheld funding from a school or district, uh, that is in fact true. We have never gotten to the point of withholding funding, um, but that is because we have been uh, very successful up till now on being able to bring schools and districts and the third parties into compliance when we do find that a violation has occurred. And we have found many violations of the law over the years but to date, we have always been successful at getting those entities into compliance once a violation has been found. Um, but there are still those who uh, say that we, we need to be stricter, we need to be more efficient in our uh, enforcement of the law. Um, to that end, we actually just went through a reorganization at the Department of Education uh, where we consolidated all of our student privacy functions to be more efficient in responding to uh, complaints and to be more effective in providing technical assistance to the field. Um, as part of that reorganization, the, the previous two offices at the department that had been responsible for student privacy got merged into the newly renamed Student Privacy Policy Office. So you may, in some resources out there, see SPPAD or FPCO referenced. Um, effective January of this year, those two organizations were, were merged into the newly renamed SPPO. So all means the same thing. We're all still doing the same functions. We just uh, consolidated to be leaner and more effective. Similarly, um, there has been criticism of our enforcement activities um, from the perspective that, well, when a parent files a complaint or when an eligible student files a complaint, it can often take a very long time for that complaint to be resolved. Uh, and by that point, violations have continued or new violations have occurred. Um, that the time that it takes for an investigation to occur was making it less effective as an enforcement action. Um, to that end, um, we have undergone a number of changes to try to improve the efficiency of our enforcement activities. And in fact, um, as of April of this year, this month, uh, we have reduced our backlog of pending FERPA complaints by over 50%. Um, and we are continuing to trend downwards on that. So we are, we are working very hard to make enforcement of these laws a priority and to make it stronger and more efficient uh, so that we can address these issues as they occur. Similarly, we have also introduced two new approaches to um, helping to resolve potential violations when they are brought to our attention. Um, effective December of this past year, uh, in addition to our formal investigations, which we conduct uh, uh, when we get complaints, we also have introduced intermediation between parents or eligible students and the school or district. Uh, and we've introduced resolution assistance uh, when we see uh, an incident where technical assistance provided in a timely manner could effectively end the violation and, and achieve compliance, achieve a resolution uh, much faster than a formal investigation would take. So we've introduced these as well. Uh, we still respond to every complaint that gets filed with us. We evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis and decide uh, what the most effective way of addressing that potential violation is in each case. Also, I want to point out, I mentioned uh, the last time FERPA was re-regulated was back in 2011. Uh, we have included on the Department's Unified Regulatory Agenda our intention to uh, update the FERPA regulations, uh, most specifically to update, clarify, and improve the current regs by addressing outstanding policy issues. Uh, so be on the lookout for that um, in the coming months and 
like into 2020. All right, I mentioned a moment ago uh, our major guidance on the subject of education technology and FERPA. That's the protecting student privacy while using online educational services, requirements and best practices from 2014. Um, this focuses on a subset, this guidance in particular focuses on a subset of education technology uh, that is um, computer software, mobile apps, web-based tools that are provided by a third party uh, to a school or district for use and that are accessed by students or their parents via the internet uh, and used as part of a school activity. Um, it does not include um, those services that are used exclusively by teachers. It does not include um, any apps or services that are used by parents or students on their own uh, outside of the school, um, the broader school setting. Um, so there's, there are some caveats to the applicability of this guidance. Um, but um, many of the principles that are included there do apply in those other contexts. This is just kind of focusing specifically on the most common set here. So what are some frequently asked questions uh, about FERPA and student privacy in the education technology space? Well, for starters, is student information that's used in an online app or service protected by FERPA? Well, those of you who know anything about FERPA know that the answer to just about any FERPA question is always, it depends. And in this case, that is exactly the answer. Uh, and what does it depend on? Well, in this case, it's going to depend on well, what information is being collected or disclosed to the uh, to the edtech provider. Um, how relatable back to the student is it? Uh, if you are using an app or service where students are required to log in or create user accounts, uh, or where there is kind of an a, an individual record for the student within the app or service odds are it's going to be protected under FERPA. If you are watching videos online from shared computers and students are not ever getting logged into a, a unique account, uh, in those cases you're probably not going to be uh, in FERPA land uh, because there's, there's no student PII getting disclosed. Uh, but in between those two extremes, um, you will have to look on a case-by-case -case basis to decide if uh, any PII from students' education records is being disclosed to the EdTech provider, and if so, how? If you are disclosing PII, or if the vendor is going to be collecting PII uh, from students' education records or maintaining it on the school's behalf, then there are three possible ways that that information can flow to the third party. We talked about consent. We talked about the directory information exception, and we talked about the school official exception. These are three ways that that is possible. However, each of them have their advantages and their limitations. Consent works great from a transparency standpoint, from uh, a pro-privacy framework. Having parents consent or eligible students consent to these disclosures is a great idea if it's not a mandatory or required piece of technology for the school because you can't force parents to waive their rights. Uh, so if it's optional, if it's a supplementary app or service in the school, by all means go the consent route. It's a great opportunity. Directory information. Well, directory information, provided the school has properly designated information as directory information and provided it's not linked or linkable to anything else and the parent or eligible student hasn't opted out, yeah, you can go ahead and disclose under this exception. What makes this exception tricky in the online app and service context, however, is it's going to be very rare for that information not to then subsequently be linked to other identifying information about the student. Because once that user account is created, use by the student for a school activity of that product and all of the data that gets generated from their interaction, some of that may contain non-directory information. Once that's linked, it's not directory information anymore and this exception wouldn't apply. So use this with caution, though it is, an op it is an option. And thirdly, the school official exception, which I mentioned before. Again, this is uh, by far the most commonly used exception to use uh, for disclosing uh, in the context of ed tech apps and services. Uh, but remember that the school official exception has those requirements about direct control, about falling within the school's definition of the use and main, sorry, the school's definition of school official with legitimate educational interest. 
There are the use limitations. You can only use it for the purpose for which it was disclosed, et cetera. So this one, as I said, by far the most common exception for which uh, information is disclosed to third parties. Uh, but key here are meeting these requirements, particularly the direct control requirement, which we're going to talk more about in the context of terms of service agreements in a minute. So our FERPA, under FERPA and PPIA, are providers limited in what they can do with the student information that they collect or receive? What's the answer to any FERPA question? It depends. And again, it depends here on, well, how did they receive it? If the PAI was disclosed using parental consent, then the vendor is only bound by whatever the terms of that consent statement were, that purpose or purposes for which it was being disclosed. If PI was being disclosed under the directory information exception, well, there's probably going to be no limitations, unless. Uh, and the unless is unless the school has adopted what's called a limited directory information policy that does provide some additional restrictions, or unless, as part of their contract with the vendor, the school has put in some contractual limitations on what the vendor can do. So be sure to look at those as well. Uh, if the PI was disclosed under the school official exception, well then, this is the key, as I mentioned, can only be used for the purpose or purposes for which it was disclosed, uh, and the providers can't sell or share that PII further except as permitted by FERPA and at the direction of the school or district. Uh, and remember, when personal information is collected directly from the student, you also have some PPRA requirements that may have to be met, along with COPPA, state laws, et cetera. Key thing to remember here, schools and districts play an important role in protecting student privacy. And the legal requirements, compliance with FERPA, compliance with PPRA, compliance with COPPA, et cetera, is the starting point. Schools can and often should go above and beyond those minimal legal requirements to establish additional protections where appropriate for better safeguarding the privacy of students and the security of their data. So, the contract, the written agreements, the terms of service can be a vehicle for the school or the district to provide additional protections uh, above and beyond the compliance with the laws. So what about metadata? We get a lot of questions about metadata. Are there restrictions on what providers can do with the metadata about students' online interactions with their service? So first off, Big question I often get is, well, what are metadata? You hear that term used a lot. It's not often defined. Um, strictly speaking, metadata is information about information. Uh, put more specifically, uh, it's information that provides additional meaning and context to the other data that's being collected. Uh, so if a student, for example, is using an online math app to practice fractions, well, some of the metadata that could be collected in addition to their right and wrong answers to the questions might be, well, what day and time are they interacting with the app? Uh, how many attempts did they make to correctly answer the question? Uh, how long did their mouse hover over their answer uh, before actually clicking, indicating uncertainty, for example? Uh, these are pieces of metadata about the student's interaction with the app or service. Um, that go beyond the basic, they clicked A, the correct answer was D. Um, so these data, these metadata, have tremendous value for ed tech providers because they allow them to um, improve their products, improve their services, and in particular, uh, improve the, the user experience of how the user interacts with the app or service by tailoring things to certain interaction types. So there is tremendous incentive for vendors to be able to make use of this metadata to improve their products and services. Metadata that have been stripped of all of their direct and indirect identifiers, metadata that have been properly de-identified, are not protected under FERPA. Remember, FERPA only protects PII from the education records. Something that has been properly de-identified is not PII any longer, so FERPA's protections would cease. However, it's important to remember that a lot of those pieces of information that may be collected may be linked or linkable to the student, even though you may not initially think that they are. And geography, school name, and so on are very common things to use to be able to kind of hone in on a particular student. So true de-identification, like proper de-identification of these data can be very tricky 
Um, also, it's important to remember that um, use and reuse of this de-identified information can be further restricted by the school or the district through their written agreement with the school, through that direct control element. So if you want to make use, as a vendor, if you want to make use of de-identified metadata, make sure that you've included in your contract or in your terms of service um, permission for you to do so. So what provisions do we recommend schools and districts look for in their contracts for online educational services? Well, the key ones here, and this is not an exhaustive list, are going to be security and data stewardship provisions. How are you going to protect the student information that you're receiving? Data collection provisions. What data are you actually collecting about the student? Data use, retention, disclosure, and destruction. What are you going to use the student information for? How long are you going to keep it? Are you going to disclose it to other third parties, business associates, subcontractors, etc.? Because remember, you're not allowed to redisclose it without the school's permission. Uh, and once you are no longer providing that service to the school, or once the school is no longer using that app or service, how are you going to destroy the data? Are you going to do it in a secure manner? Data access provisions. This is an important one under FERPA, because remember, parents have the right to access their students' education records. So if a third party is maintaining, creating or maintaining education records on the school's behalf, well then a parent has the right to access those. Now we recommend that schools allow parents to exercise that through the school acting as an intermediary. So there should be provisions in your agreement between the school and the vendor specifying how the school will make requests for parental access to those records how those data will be delivered to the school for then provision to the parent or eligible student. So data access provisions. Um, modification, duration, and termination provisions. This is a really important one, and one that I've seen some really terrible examples of in uh, terms of service agreements over the years. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen a user agreement say, vendor reserves the right to modify or change this agreement at any time without notice. Well. Direct control. Remember, if you're using the school official exception, you need to have direct control over the third party. It's going to be hard to demonstrate that you are exercising direct control over your contractor, over your vendor, if they can change the terms of the contract at any point without telling you. So this is a particularly important one, is that what are the terms, what are the provisions for how the vendor can change that terms of service agreement or that user agreement or that contract? And where appropriate, uh, it might be uh, wise to include indemnification or warranty provisions. Uh, I will forward you to your, uh, to your own counsel for when that is best and when not. Question five. Uh, what about online educational services that use click wrap agreements instead of traditional contracts? So for those of you who don't know, click wrap agreements are those things where you're presented with that 36-page privacy policy in tiny print in legal jargon that you can understand that most of us on our own apps and devices scroll quickly through and just click I agree. Um, who here has done that? I certainly have. Um, in the school context, these are very important. We can't just take the risk of running through it and clicking I agree without reading it that we often do for ourselves as individuals. Remember. A user agreement like this, a, a click wrap or um, a user license agreement, this comes by different names, is the contractual vehicle between the data user and the provider. That is the legal agreement that establishes the rules of the road. It establishes what security provisions, if any, are going to be applied to the data. It establishes what they can use it for. It establishes who they can share the information with and why. If a school is going to properly exercise direct control over a third party provider, if that provider is using a click wrap agreement, then the click wrap agreement is the vehicle by which the school is going to be doing that. So I'll say these traditional written two way contracts are certainly ideal. They're not always feasible in today's um, user agreement world. Um, if you have to rely on click wrap agreements to exercise direct control, we strongly recommend that you check amendment provisions. Essentially, see, is the vendor 
including a provision that allows them to modify the agreement without notice. Um, we recommend printing or saving the terms of service so you can go back and see what the vendor um, had committed themselves to. And we recommend that districts and schools be very explicit about who within their district has the authority to enter into these agreements. Who has the authority to click I accept or I agree on that click wrap? Because in many districts, while individual teachers are typically the ones signing students up for that great new math app that they just found out about, in many districts, individual teachers are not authorized to enter into binding agreements, legally binding agreements for the district. So if they can't enter into legally binding agreements, then they're not properly committing the vendor to how they're gonna use and protect the data, which means they're not school officials, which means they've just violated FERPA. So be very explicit within your school or district on who has the authority uh, to click I agree. And if you are going to allow teachers to sign up students for these apps themselves, you should have policies in place that govern what the, what the teachers should be reviewing these apps for or what other approvals may be necessary. Other things to look for in terms of service, how the vendor defines data or PII. Um, terms of service uh, will often define covered information uh, in ways that deviates either subtly or substantially from the legal terms that govern the protection of these data from the legal standpoint. Um, so they may say, P they may call it PII, they may call it data, they may call it user data. Look how they are defining it because how they've defined this is gonna determine the scope of the protections that are then further uh, elaborated within the privacy policy. Marketing and advertising. Um, provisions will often include, sorry, terms of service agreements will often include provisions about whether the data can be used for marketing and advertising. Uh, if so, look at whether that's acceptable or not. Um, targeted advertising or targeted marketing using student PII from education records is likely gonna violate the law. Data de-identification. We talked about this a moment ago. De-identification is tough. Vendors frequently want to be able to make use of de-identification, de-identified data. So a well-written terms of service agreement, a very pro-privacy terms of service agreement, will specify how the data are to be de-identified to ensure that it is properly done and that it is done sufficient to meet FERPA standards and the standards of any other laws that may apply. Modification of the terms of service, we've, we've talked about this already. Um, not unusual to, for a terms of service to allow material changes without notice. Again, it's gonna be very difficult to exercise direct control if those types of provisions are included. Data collection, uh, a very pro-privacy terms of service agreement will specify what data are being collected um, and frequently why. Um, but problematic terms of service often include um, provisions that establish that access to the service, access to the app or service through a third party site, meaning you got there through someone else's site, constitutes an exception to the rest of the rules. We see this a lot where a vendor may have one privacy policy for their education suite of apps and another privacy policy that applies to their non-education suite of apps. And if you go and use one of the non-education suite of apps and it brings you back to one of the education suite, it may supersede that original privacy policy and be more broad. So uh, problematic provisions um, can include things to that effect. All right, so what does all this mean? Um, how does this actually look in practice? So I wanna take, I think we still have, uh, still have time. Uh, I wanna take a few minutes and walk through uh, a sample click wrap agreement, a sample user agreement privacy policy uh, to look at some good and bad provisions. However, I did not, for obvious reasons, want to use an actual company's terms of service agreements because I didn't want to shame anybody or hold anybody up to an unreasonable standard. Um, so no actual EdTech terms of service agreements were harmed in the making of this presentation. Uh, I've included a completely fictitious terms of service for a completely fictitious company. So meet Martin. Martin is my almost 15-year-old shepherd. 
And while he is frequently a very good boy, um, he occasionally wants to take over the world and has some pretty extreme ideas about what is acceptable behavior. So Martin has decided that he wants to enter into the EdTech space. And he has rolled out this wonderful new suite called Martin's Unified Teaching and Testing Service, or MUTS for short. And in, in very common fashion, he has made his privacy policy long, difficult to read, uh, and in tiny print with a big I accept button. Um, he doesn't have thumbs, so he had to make it big, you know. Um, so let's look at some of these provisions and decide if on the day he wrote this, he was being a good dog or he was being a bad dog. So for starters, his definition of data. Student information only includes user information knowingly provided in the course of using this service. Well, this is a problem. Very much a bad dog provision. Uh, a better approach would have been to broaden that definition, saying only information knowingly collected. Uh, that excludes all sorts of things. So a better approach would have been student information includes all personally identifiable information and other non-public information. Student information includes but is not limited to information provided by or about students, metadata, and user content. So this has established a very broad definition of what is covered in the subsequent provisions of the agreement. So if he were being a good dog, this is what he would have included. All right. Provisions about data use, let's take a look. After use of MUTS services has begun and user has provided student information, MUTS may use student information for the following purposes. Operation of MUTS services in fulfillment of this agreement, okay. Targeted advertising and other business related purposes. So problematic here, targeted advertising, that's a big red flag. And other business related purposes, what on earth does that even mean? That could mean just about anything, depending on what business you're in. So I would definitely, oh, I skipped one. Oh, there we go. Um, oh, there was a second provision, that's why. Uh, after, oh, we got that. There we go, bad dog. All right, a better provision to this effect would have been after use of MUTS services has begun and user has provided student information, MUTS may only use student information for educational purposes in fulfillment of this agreement. So they've, they've constrained themselves here. This is tying into that direct control requirement of only using the data for the purpose or purposes for which it's being disclosed. So good dog provision would have had this very narrow data use provision for what they can do with the data. Data retention, preservation of student information. MUTS maintains the right to preserve and use student, inf student information after termination of this agreement. Okay, that's a very bad dog provision. Um, because it's the school's data, it's the student's data. Why should the vendor have the right to hold on to identifiable information when they're no longer serving as a school official? Better provision here would be When student information is no longer needed for its specified purpose, or upon termination of this agreement, all student information in the possession of MUTS and any of its subcontractors will be destroyed or returned to the district under the district's direction. Within 30 days of termination of an account, all student information associated with that account will be purged using NIST-approved data destruction and media sanitation methods for sensitive data. There are several really good things in here. The first is the commitment to destroy or return the data within 30 days of kind of cessation of use of the product or uh, on request. The second is that user accounts and any things will be purged from the system and that that purging will be done using established standards for data destruction and media sanitation. So they're being very specific here and this is certainly something to look for. Um, so this would be a good dog provision. Information sharing. This is a very common one you see in terms of service. Uh, MUTs may share information with our subcontractors and business partners. Where feasible, MUTs will require third parties to comply with this agreement. Well, subcontractors can understand that, but the idea about where feasible will make them comply. Now remember, direct control. The school has to be able to establish direct control over anyone acting as a school official. That would include the vendor and any subcontractors that are providing services to the vendor. 
So there needs to be a mechanism for that direct control to cascade down the chain. Uh, so for starters, there needs to be a provision that allows the vendor to redisclose information to its subcontractors. And then there needs to be a provision that establishes that the vendor, when disclosing information to its subcontractors, will ensure that they meet those same requirements that the school has established through this terms of service. So this is a bad dog provision. Much better provision would be, you understand that MUTs will rely on one or more subcontractors to perform services under this agreement. It's fine to include subcontractor provisions, provided that you've laid them out like this. Uh, MUTs agrees to share the names of these subcontractors with you upon request. This is actually a great one because it means that the school can, if they, if they choose to, kind of audit how this is going on. They could get a list of any third party that's receiving student information. So a nice provision here. Um, and all subcontractors and successor entities will be subject to the terms of this agreement. This is also a great provision because it, it binds everybody down the chain, but it also, the successor entities is an important one because frequently we've seen situations where a vendor goes out of business and they sell their assets off and those assets may or may not include student information. So including provisions here guarantees that in that kind of ambiguous situation that companies often find themselves in if they're getting sold or bought, that the protections continue to the successor entities. License to student information. Providing information or user content grants months an irrevocable right to license, distribute, transmit, or publicly display student information or user content. I have seen a variant of this provision in so many terms of service agreements over the years. I am happy to say that it is getting less frequent that it's being included in education technology terms of service. You still see it from time to time, um, but this is really problematic because this essentially is granting them the right to use the information for whatever they want, for their own personal purposes, to redisclose it, et cetera. So this is very much a bad dog provision. Much better provision would be, Mutz has a limited license solely for the purpose of performing its obligations as outlined in this agreement. So that use restriction that we talked about earlier. This agreement does not give MUTs any rights implied or otherwise to student information, content, or intellectual property, except as expressly stated in this agreement. So they've, they've really constrained themselves here. They can use it for the purpose of providing the service, and that's about it. So a good dog provision. Provision on data collection suspiciously absent from Martin's terms of service agreement here. Uh, so they're very much a bad dog. Um, if he were having a good day, uh, he would have included a provision to the effect that Mutz will only collect student information necessary to fulfill its duties as outlined in this agreement. This means that they won't be secretly collecting and tracking all of this other additional data about students that may be unrelated to the service that's actually being provided. And you'd be surprised how frequently this actually happens. Data security, also suspiciously absent from this privacy policy. So another example of a bad dog provision in its absence. A good security provision would be to prevent unauthorized access, maintain data accuracy, and ensure the proper use of information. MUTS utilizes appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards in accordance with industry best practices. MUTS also uses secure socket layer, protocol on your account information to protect student information. So there's a couple things here. Um, the first is you might think, oh, well, that seems kind of vague. Industry best practices, who establishes those? Well, this can be acceptable uh, because the technical standards for meeting data security, for example, can change fairly quickly. Industry best practices may seem vague but at least it's a commitment to kind of the, the administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. So they're, they're laying out the different layers of data security they're gonna be doing, and they're committing themselves to at least doing what is commonly done to protect the information. If they had written in a specific standard they were gonna follow, well, that standard may be obsolete by the time this user agreement ceases to have its validity. So, I could, I, could, I could live with this provision where they're, they're committing themselves to following industry best practices. Modification of the agreement. Mutz reserves the right to modify this agreement at any time. 
Notice will be posted to the service website if the changes are deemed by MUTs to be significant. This is a very bad dog provision for the reasons we've already discussed. Much better approach would be for essentially notice and consent. So MUTs will provide 60 days advance notice of any proposed changes to this agreement. Notice will be provided prominently on the MUT service website and the notification will be sent to the email address on file for all users registered with the service. Users who do not wish to consent to the new terms of service may terminate their MUTs accounts at any time by contacting MUTs. So they're doing two things here. They're providing, actually they're doing three things. They're providing a time period before which any changes will go into effect. They're providing general notice and they're providing targeted notice of those proposed changes. And that time period then allows the school or the district to decide if they don't want to accept those new changes and they can terminate the agreement. And remember, the data destruction provision said that within 30 days of termination, all of the data will be returned or purged. So provided the school is doing its due diligence here, they will have time after this notification to review everything, make a decision, and if they don't like the new terms of service, they can terminate and have the data be gone before these new provisions go into effect. So this is an excellent example of a very pro-privacy provision because it gives that advance notice and the opportunity to withdraw in an effective way. So if you're a vendor, how do your own company's terms of service compare with Martin's. Hopefully you're more on the good dog end of the spectrum. Uh, if you are a school or a district, use these as examples. Now it's not that any of the bad dog provisions would necessarily violate the law, um, but they raise red flags. They are things that you need to be concerned about. Um, every terms of service agreement is gonna be slightly different. You will likely never find ones that use these exact wordings, either on the good side or the bad side but these are the types of things to look for. Uh, if you want to get more information about these, we have resources on our website uh, that provide additional uh, provision examples, both on the good side and the bad side to look at. Um, we also uh, have resources to help you if you want um, somebody to kind of go through your terms of service and provide some best practice recommendations. Uh, and to that end, um, we're from the government and we're here to help. Um, Technical assistance is an important part of what we see as our core mission uh, for student privacy at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we do extensive technical assistance to the field, as I mentioned before, um, through our Privacy Technical Assistance Center in my office, PTAC. Um, you can access those resources at studentprivacy.ed.gov. Uh, we've got a wide variety of things from guidance and best practice documents. We've got YouTube videos on common FERPA topics. Uh, we've got uh, data security checklists, data governance checklists, and much, much more. Uh, if those resources don't answer your questions, uh, we also operate a student privacy help desk um, where you can submit your questions. You can send them into privacyta at ed.gov, and I've got a team who uh, is ready and willing to, to attempt to answer your specific questions if our general guidance isn't enough. So uh, with that, I will open things up to questions. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate it. Uh, we've compiled everyone's questions. So uh, first and foremost, who decides if someone is a school official? Do they have to be designated as such by the school? Can it just be assumed? And can the school or a teacher change their minds about someone being an official later? OK, so that's, there's, there's several pieces to that question. Um, for starters, uh, I would go back to, um, it, it's the district, it's the school or the district that is designating somebody as a school official because they're the ones who are deciding that they're gonna utilize this exception to the consent requirement to provide PII to a third party. Um, there are restrictions, as I mentioned, to when they can do that. Uh, for starters, they can only do it to somebody who falls within how they as a school or district have defined who they constitute to be school officials and what they constitute to be legitimate educational interest. Um, they also then need to be able to exercise direct control uh, over the third party's use and maintenance of the data, et cetera. So it will be the school or district that is deciding that subject to those constraints. And yeah, absolutely a school or district can decide that a third party will no longer be a school official. Uh, but there, the, the 
direct control requirement would then obligate the district to ensure that any data that the third party had received gets properly, uh, properly disposed. So next question here, what are districts supposed to do if they notice their vendors uh, are acting in a way that would cause the school to violate FERPA? So what are the districts supposed to do if they find or if they're informed that the vendors are using student information in a way that might violate FERPA? Uh, well, so part of that would depend on the nature of um, the allegation. Uh, if it's something uh, as simple as um, not applying sufficient data security, that, that could be accomplished by reaching out and saying, hey, notice that you're, you're storing these passwords in, in open text. Uh, like Terms of our agreement really require you to do more than that to encrypt these at rest and in, in transit. Um, they could reach out and, and kind of use their contractual uh, mechanisms to, to encourage and require uh, the vendor to improve. Um, if it's more serious, um, if there has actually been a disclosure, an unauthorized disclosure, or if they're, they, the third party is using the student information for purposes that are not allowed, uh, then the school could um, contact uh, the U.S. Department of Education and we can step in. Um, we could, at our discretion, decide to open a self-initiated investigation against the third party um, to uh, compel them to, to change their practices or to impose a five-year ban uh, if it's particularly egregious. Uh, or alternatively, uh, the district could encourage one or more parents uh, to file a formal complaint themselves and we would investigate it uh, in that case. So there, there's, a variety of, there's a variety of paths the district could take. Um, if they don't know which path is best, they can contact PTAC, uh, privacyta at ed.gov, and we can kind of walk them through what, uh, what the best option might be. So you started addressing this in your presentation, but if FERPA is rarely enforced and if schools aren't likely to lose money, why does FERPA matter? So I'm going to challenge something that you just said, like your statement that FERPA is rarely enforced. FERPA is frequently enforced. Um, we issue findings from our investigations all the time. Um, you don't hear about them very often because we bring the schools into compliance. Um, we don't have to resort to withholding funding. Um, so FERPA is absolutely enforced. Um, but to your broader question of why does FERPA matter if we have never actually had to resort to withholding funding, uh, I think it matters for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think for starters, in most cases, people want to do the right thing. Um, we as a society care about our children. We as a society care about protecting our vulnerable populations. Um, so I, I don't think it is very common. From my own observations of our own investigations into FERPA, we don't see, we do not see frequent cases of people willfully violating the law. They do occur, but more often when we see violations, it's because somebody wasn't aware, somebody made a mistake, somebody didn't understand. Uh, so those are much more frequent. For the most part, those who are operating in the education space want to do the right thing. So FERPA matters because it sets the ground rules for what people understand as what the right thing to do is, or at least what the beginning of the right thing to do. As I mentioned, compliance is the floor, it's the baseline. Um, so I think it matters from that perspective. Uh, I think it also matters uh, because it provides a clear framework for everyone to be able to speak a common language about what those legal requirements are. So that schools and parents and vendors and researchers and anyone who might be touching student information that may have different perspectives and different incentives for what they want to do, all with the best of intentions, likely, they have a common framework that they all know and understand what their rights and responsibilities are. I think thirdly, um, FERPA is important for the reputational impact. That people, like you don't need to withhold someone's funding for them to be negatively impacted by a finding of a violation of FERPA. Uh, we've seen frequent instances where the fact that, uh, that we issued a finding against a school caused reputational harm sufficient for the school to substantively change its policies and practices, not just to meet 
the compliance requirements that we establish through our enforcement action, but to go above and beyond and to respond to parent criticisms of their data practices. So that reputational effect of, viola of violations can be substantial. Uh, and lastly, I mean, the heavy hand of the law doesn't have to be used often, but it is still the heavy hand of the law. If somebody does violate the law, doesn't want to come into compliance, does something particularly egregious, you can be guaranteed we will, we will use our enforcement mechanisms uh, to their greatest effect. It's just we try to bring everybody into compliance first. So. Who is able to make a FERPA complaint? Ah, uh, so in order to uh, formally file a FERPA complaint, you have to have standing. And that standing is you either have to be a parent or an eligible student, as defined. So a parent of a student uh, who is attending or has attended uh, an educational agency or institution that is subject to the law, or you have to be the eligible student yourself, either having turned 18 or having enrolled in a post-secondary institution. Can other people bring matters to your attention? Oh, absolutely. Um, so if you are aware of a violation or potential violation, if you're aware of practices that may not be up to snuff, uh, and you are not a parent or an eligible student, you can absolutely uh, send them in to my office. You can send them in to our help desk, uh, and we'll look into them. Uh, we do have the authority to self-initiate investigations. Uh, we can also proactively provide technical assistance to the school or the district or the vendor to try to improve their practices short of actually um, stepping into an enforcement action. With products that use data outside of what would be allowed under FERPA, is there specific guidance on opt-in versus opt-out? Products that use data outside of FERPA, is there specific guidance on opt-in or opt-out? Um, that's a complex, complicated worded question. So uh, let, me, let me think about that. Um, I think where you will most likely find, um, where you will most likely find provisions there that would apply would be in the Protection of People Rights Amendment which I mentioned before. Um, PPRA has been around almost as long as FERPA has and can be somewhat difficult to understand, but it does govern um, when parents have a right to provide written consent, so the opt-in, when parents have the right to opt out, or when parents have the right to be notified and uh, be able to inspect, short of being able to opt in or opt out. Um, we have resources on our website where you can find that. We've got a model notice of parental rights under PPRA that schools can use to establish their policies. Uh, included in that is a summary of when those different rights get triggered. Uh, we also just recently, last year, issued a guidance document on the subject of college admissions exams, but that included a very lengthy discussion of uh, requirements and best practices under PPRA, so I would point, uh, point you to that. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of lays out when you would need consent versus when you would need opt-out versus when you could do opt-in. How can a school or district know that vendor privacy policies are actually followed? How can a district know when vendor privacy policies are actually followed? Um, that can be a challenge for many districts. I mean, many districts out there are very kind of strapped for resources and they may not have um, they may not have substantial attention to be able, or substantial uh, resources sufficient to auditing uh, the third party vendors that they're working with. Uh, I think key there is you have to do what's reasonable. Uh, throughout FERPA, we have requirements that um, schools and districts use reasonable methods uh, for a variety of contexts. Uh, so doing what is reasonable uh, in one context will, will differ dramatically from another. I think if you are a, a, a major research university um, engaging in high value contracts for a student information system, I, I think the expectations for how you would verify compliance with the, the security provisions, for example, would be substantially more intense than similar provisions for uh, a small rural school. We wouldn't expect the same degree because the, the quantity and sensitivity of the data is probably different. Um, I think there are some proxies that schools can use uh, to the to the effect that they can rest at least somewhat assured that the vendor has a history of 
complying with the terms of its own privacy policies. Um, there is no such thing as a FERPA seal of approval. We can't say a vendor is compliant, um, nor can anyone out there say, oh, this vendor is compliant with FERPA, except for the school district. The only people who can decide that someone is complying with the rules would be the school district designating themselves. Um, but there are a number of um, there are a number of kind of proxy, I don't want to call them certifications, um, proxy entities out there that can help with alleviating the burden on schools of doing those reviews. Those include things like uh, FPF and SIA's Student Privacy Pledge. Uh, it includes um, the, the COSIN Trusted Learning Environment. It includes the, um, the A4L Student Data Consortium who review in one way or another the privacy provisions and the technical implementations of these. We don't endorse any of those. We can't endorse any of those. Uh, but these are extensively used by the vendor community. They're extensively used by schools and districts as a mechanism for increasing scrutiny of vendors' compliance with these provisions and for helping to demonstrate, helping to demonstrate to schools that they meet the requirements that they've established within their own policies. So in the model terms of service uh, you showed in the provision uh, to destroy or return data to the school upon the ending of the contract, instead of saying that the vendor will destroy or return the data to the school, is it possible for the company to say they may keep de-identified information or some other anonymized, pseudonymized uh, information? Uh, is, it, is it possible? Anything's possible. Um, uh, yes, under FERPA, it would be permissible under the school official exception for uh, terms of service agreement to, or any contract between a vendor and the school under the school official exception, to establish that the vendor may de-identify the data and then retain the de-identified data um, for use beyond the, the term of the contract. I think the key points there, as I mentioned, FERPA ceases to apply when data have been properly de-identified. So the key, the key things to look for there, if, the, if that route is going to be taken, would be to make sure that the data are properly de-identified. Uh, de-identification, particularly of individual level data, can be extraordinarily difficult. Um, so establishing, uh, establishing some standards, establishing the expectations for what statistical disclosure limitation techniques need to be used to de-identify the data would be a starting point. Um, I think further, the school should reflect on whether they want the vendor to be able to use de-identified data. The school could absolutely insist on a provision that says no, vendor cannot de-identify data or keep de-identified data. It's the school's data. They get to determine what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, so including either positively or negatively um, that provision about whether the data can be de-identified in the first place I think would be important. Establishing the standards um, would then be the next best step because it lays out the expectations for just how, just how much the, the vendor would need to be able to do to guarantee that the data can't be re-identified. Are there any indicators of when data has been adequately de-identified or that the vendor is uh, skilled or has some experience with de-identification that districts can ask? So that is an excellent question. Um, I think frequently a good starting point would, would just be to ask the vendor how they propose to de-identify the data. Um, a, a warning sign would be, oh, we'll strip student ID off. Um, we, you'll frequently hear that mentioned, like, oh, we'll strip name and ID off the file. Um, that, in most cases, is not going to be sufficient to de-identify the data, but there are many out there who, when they think of de-identification, that's what they think of. So uh, just starting the conversation and asking what their proposed methodology is, um, what the proper techniques are going to be beyond that to get to de-identified data, um, that varies substantially based on the nature of the data in question, like how much data there is, what other data might be available? Um, is it a snapshot file? Is it longitudinal? Is it aggregate? Is it individual level? Um, which data elements are being collected? All of those can impact uh, 
the choices that need to be made to properly de-identify data. Uh, the other thing that's important to remember is complete true de-identification of data is practically impossible mathematically. Um, when we talk about de-identification, when we talk about proper de-identification, we're talking about de-identification sufficient to reduce the risk of re-identification to an acceptable level. And under FERPA, that acceptable level is the, the reasonable person in the school community. Uh, but we generally recommend that schools go way above and beyond that uh, when they're talking individual level data. Um, so what techniques you're going to need to do to, to mitigate that risk of re-identification is going to vary substantially. There are a number of resources out there. Uh, the federal government has done a lot of work in this space. Uh, so I would point you to um, the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodologies Working Paper 22. Uh, which kind of provides a compendium of techniques that you can use and frameworks for evaluating that. Are there particular requirements or indicators uh, that a company's security is meeting FERPA's requirements? So FERPA does not have a security standard in place. Um, we do not specify uh, what security protocols need to be used in various settings. Uh, instead, we say that those who are tasked with safeguarding um, PII from students' education records, be they schools or vendors and, and so on, uh, they need to use reasonable methods. Now, as I mentioned before, what is a reasonable method is going to vary based on the context. Um, I think the, what is typically considered the gold standard for federal agencies would be the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, IT security standards. Um, the FISMA security standards, uh, et cetera, those may not be appropriate uh, in all situations and frequently may be overkill uh, for some smaller schools, for some smaller data systems, et cetera. But they, they would be the gold standard. Um, I think there are a number of resources out there, including several that we've put out, that can be uh, useful tools for schools to decide just how, how strong their protections need to be and how to tailor them to best address the risks and vulnerabilities of their unique systems. Can parental or eligible student consent be given very broadly? For example, how it is to, in the annual notice? Okay, so can, can the written consent form be very broad? Um, yes, it can, although we typically encourage it not to be. Um, to be valid, the written consent needs to do those three things that I mentioned. It needs to specify the PII to be disclosed, specify the party or parties to whom it can be disclosed, um, or uh, sorry, and specify why the disclosure is being made. Um, I think you could meet that by saying, uh, I, I consent disclosing all of my education records to anyone for any purpose. I mean, you've, you've laid out those three requirements in an incredibly open-ended way, but you've also completely divorced them from any, from any protections. So I would strongly encourage parents and eligible students never to sign such an agreement, such a consent form, but it, it would meet the, the legal requirement established under the law. For the directory information exception, can you clarify if the limits you described apply only to that exception and what limits apply to any subsequent non-directory information collected from the student or school? So that's going to depend a lot on the context. Um, I think the good example there would be um, we've seen instances where a teacher will use directory information or quote unquote directory information to establish user accounts um, for an app that's going to be used in the classroom. Um, but then, and so student name and email address, for example. Um, but then the student is making use of that app to take all of their tests, to get their grades, et cetera. Um, I think that would be an example. If, if the student is taking tests via the app and the app is then maintaining those test scores as the official record of the student's performance, um, I think you've, you've clearly ventured out of the territory of this is just directory information. It's now PI from education records linked to that directory information. And 
like that exception. You would need you would need to have another exception there that governed the vendor's ability to collect that information from the student. Can companies share data with researchers to prove efficacy of their product or f further education research generally? Uh, I won't say that it's impossible, uh, but generally speaking, no. Because remember, under the um, under the school official exception, uh, the third party that's receiving PAI from education records can only use it for the specific purpose or purposes for which it was disclosed and cannot re-disclose the data except, as, uh, except in compliance with FERPA and at the direction of the school or district. So gen in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, uh, those limitations would prohibit a company from doing that. There, it would be feasible for a school to decide that they wanted some particular evaluation done and to permit the third party to redisclose pursuant to another exception to the consent requirement, for example, the studies exception or the audit and evaluation exception, which we didn't go into today, but we have resources online. Um, it could be pursuant there, but then there would be additional requirements that would have to be met, and that could only, and I really stress, only be done if the school was the one kind of directing it to be done. So last questions. Any special requirements that are specifically applicable to special ed students? Yes, so um, as I mentioned, there are a variety of laws that apply in the student privacy space. Today, we, we focused almost exclusively on, on FERPA, but we, we heard about COPPA earlier. I touched on PPRA. Um, there is also the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, which has, excuse me, which has confidentiality provisions that apply to um, data on, on students um, with, with disabilities that are receiving services under that law. In most cases, those provisions mirror the FERPA provisions, although there are some notable deviations. Um, we have resources online that kind of um, highlight what those requirements are. Uh, the Department's Office of Special Education uh, and Special Education and Rehabilitative Services uh, has um, a variety of TA centers that can provide additional, uh, additional help and assistance there. Uh, so I would certainly um, check those resources out because we don't have time or th the right people here today to, to talk about those. Um, additionally, you'll also find through the various state laws um, ad additional protections that are going to layer on top of all of these. So yeah, so we focused on a, a, a slice, perhaps the most well-known slice of privacy laws that are relevant here. Uh, there are others and, and you should certainly check out, um, check out or consult with your counsel and, and check out the resources that are available. Thank you very much. Thank you.